Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me to talk to the Bremhill Parish History Group. Delighted to be talking to you all this morning. Um, I'm Rosalind Johnson, and I'm a researcher with the Victoria County History Project, the Wiltshire Victoria County History Project. And I've been involved with the project since 2015. At the moment, I'm writing up a history of Harden Huish Parish. And I've just begun research on a new project for the VCH Wiltshire, which is on southeast Wiltshire. So got the other end of the country from where you all are, but a bit closer to where I am. But recently, quite recently, in fact, I was working on the economic, social and religious history of Outer Chippenham, um, which included the settlements of Stanley and of Titherton Lucas. Um, though not the rest of Bremhill, which of course uh, Louise has been um, researching with, with you all. So I do apologise in advance if some of this talk is a bit biased towards Stanley and Tifford and Lucas. Um, I have, believe me, made efforts um, in spite of the challenges of conducting historical research in lockdown <laughs> to include um, examples from the rest of Bremhill as well. So nobody feels left out. Um, but I would like to say uh, that I'm very grateful to Louise for the help that she's given me in some of the research for this paper. So thank you very much, Louise, for that. I see my short talk today is definitely not as uh, in any way a comprehensive or a definitive guide to how people made a living in historic Bremhill. I see it very much as a contribution towards your own ongoing research into the parish. Um, and as I know that your group has been working um, on wills, but especially on the census from 1881 onwards, I'll be talking largely about the period before the latter half of the 19th century. Now, you all probably know of the 17th century antiquary, John Aubrey, and you may very well know his famous comment about North Wiltshire. He wrote, and this is in the later part of the 17th century, in North Wiltshire, hereabout is but little tillage or hard labour. They only milk the cows and make cheese. They feed chiefly on milk meats, which cools their brains too much. So what John Aubrey is saying here is that the dairy industry is dominant in North Wiltshire. And in fact, in the whole quote, he goes on to contrast this with the sheep and corn husbandry of South Wiltshire. And we can see evidence of this dominance of the dairy industry and the consequent purchase of cattle in 17th century North Wiltshire from the records of Castle Coombe Fair. And this was a, a great market for the sale of livestock, which attracted um, people from farmers from all over. Uh, North Wiltshire and in fact beyond the county boundaries as well. And in the 1660s we do have uh, records of Bremhill men buying cows and calves at this fair. So people were going from Bremhill to Castlecombe Fair not just to meet up with their mates and have a few beers but also to con conduct business as well to buy um, cows and calves. But this is actually far from the only evidence of cattle dealing in Bremhill. Some of it was a bit illegal I have to say. In 1612, uh, so in the early part of the 17th century, this is in the reign of James I, William Scott of Bremhill was charged with buying cattle illegally. He was buying them outside of an authorised market or fair, which he was not supposed to do. Uh, we don't quite know what happened to him, but that was, that was the charge. He was probably fined for, for doing this. Three years later, in 1615, two Bremhill men, John and William Jeffreys, or Jeffrey, were both charged separately with buying live cattle, and they were selling them unofficially at Westminster, which of course is in London. Um, they were probably selling them for slaughter. Uh, Westminster sounds a long way away from Bremhill, but it was in fact an important hub for Wiltshire drovers. And so the Jeffreys journey to London with their cattle uh, was probably not that unusual. Farming was more mixed before the arrival of the railways. 
but the importance of pastoral farming is clear even in the 17th, 16th century um, which was 100 years or so before John Aubrey was writing about the milking the cows and making the cheese. In 1588, so in the reign of Elizabeth I, the 54 acres of glebe land at Bremhill included 32 acres of meadowland. So in other words, almost two thirds of the glebe land was meadow. In 1608, the glebe land at Titherton Lucas included the right of the rector to pasture on the common land two cattle in one year and two cattle or kine was the word used uh, the following year so alternately two cattle one year and three the next and then two and then three and so on and a century and a half after John Aubrey was writing the dominance of cattle and the need to pasture and feed them is illustrated by the 19th century tithe apportionments in 1838 Titherton Lucas had 59 acres of arable land subject to tithes, but a whopping 493 acres of meadow. So in other words, that's almost nine times as much meadow land as arable. The difference wasn't quite so pronounced in the parish of Bremhill, but it was still quite significant. In 1848, there was four times as much meadow land as arable in Bremhill that was subject to tithes. And in the tithing of Stanley and Nevermore, there was also four times as much meadow and pasture as there was arable land subject to tithes. I don't want this talk just to be a recitation of statistics. So I had a look in newspapers to find something that was a bit more interesting to liven up this talk. Um, on the subject of cows, an oddity from 1829 was reported in newspapers as far away as Norfolk. Um, about a cow belonging to one James Fell of Titherton Lucas. Uh, and this cow gave birth to three calves at one birth, which was quite exceptional. I, I imagine it would be quite exceptional today. Um, the newspapers happily reported that the calves and their mother were all doing well, which is, which is kind of nice to hear. I wondered if this James Fell was the same as the J Fell of Titherton, who had um, eight years earlier, before his cow gave birth to the triplets, um, had won second prize in the annual sheep shearing competition of the Wiltshire Agricultural Society. Um, I don't know, but it probably seems quite likely. Which leads me conveniently onto the subject of sheep. Um, also having a look in the newspapers, um, Thomas Crook of Titherton Lucas, and of course everybody from Titherton Lucas will have heard of Thomas Crook. Uh, in 1795, he sold some of his stock um, and the advertisement in the Bath Chronicle advertising the sale rhapsodized about these sheep as being of the new Leicester breed, well known for their beauty. I was absolutely enchanted by that. I mean, nothing about the sheep's meat, nothing about their wool, but only about their good looks. <laughs> I don't know if they ever held beauty contests for sheep, but um, yeah, I would love to have seen these Leicester sheep. I don't know if Leicester sheep are particularly beautiful, but, uh, but I'm sure they are. Now, in Titherton Lucas and in Stanley, which, as I said, I wrote about for the uh, Outer Chippenham section of the VCH history, dairy farming predominated by the end of the 19th century. And so important was the dairy industry that in 1905, a small halt, Stanley Bridge Halt, was built on the railway line to carry milk churns. Passengers, human passengers, were only a, a very secondary consideration. In fact, when Currycombe Farm was advertised for sale by auction in 1914, the sale catalogue specifically noted the nearby halt as convenient for the disposal of dairy produce and stock. Of course, most families in Bremhill would have been dependent on agriculture for their living in the 19th century. As Louise has found, in 1821, 286 of 330 families in Bremhill were chiefly dependent on agriculture for their employment. And 60 years later, in 1881, the majority of the adult population was still employed in agriculture. But agriculture was not the only occupation in historic Bremhill. Farming is thirsty work. And so it's not surprising that by 1820, an alehouse was recorded in Bremhill. 
Now this alehouse appears to have been licensed according to the regulations. But not all Bremhill's entrepreneurs necessarily kept strictly to the law. Making a living might involve some slightly dodgy practices. In 1611, Robert Davis of Bremhill was charged with working as a weaver without having served the required apprenticeship. And in 1616, two Bremhill men were charged with buying wool and yarn, but not intending to make it into cloth, as they should have done. Uh, it's not entirely clear what they were going to be doing with the wool and yarn once they bought it, if they weren't going to make it into cloth, but it's possible they were planning on acting as middlemen and so they were going to sell it on at a higher price um, to somebody else. But what these cases do illustrate is the importance of the cloth industry in the area. And that's confirmed by evidence that Louise has found from Wills that indicate that broadcloth and serge weaving were taking place in 17th and 18th century Bremhill. And Wills also show that shoemaking was taking place in Bremhill in the 18th and 19th centuries. And the presence of cloth and shoemaking in the parish is shown in the apprenticeship registers. Bremhill men were taking on apprentices in these trades. So we have James Wallace of Bremhill who was working as a serge maker in 1719, so that's the beginning of the Georgian period, when he took on an apprentice. And about 40 years later, Giles Hedges, who was a cord wainer, that is a shoemaker, took on an apprentice in 1752. Continuing with the subject of cloth and clothing, there is an intriguing case from 1610. A Bremhill resident, Robert Wellstead informed on a Khan tailor for having six apprenticeships when the legal limit was three apprentices. Now, Roberts was Robert Wellstead of Bremhill acting as a concerned citizen for the well-being of the apprentices? Or was he taking revenge for some unsatisfactory tailoring? We may never know. But what we do know is that in the early 17th century, informing on your neighbours for breaches of trading laws could be a mildly profitable sideline, since the informer got a half share of the fine. The problem was that the Exchequer Court in which these cases were heard was in Westminster, which of course is a long way from Bremhill, as we've said before. Consequently, many Wiltshire cases were presented in the Exchequer Court in Westminster, not by Wiltshire men, but by London based professional informers who would have been acting on information received from local Wiltshire based informers in return for a share of the fine money. We find that Richard Craft, who was a miller of Bremhill, was accused by one of these London based informers in 1615 for engrossing grain, that is, he was cornering supplies of grain to sell later at a profit. On the subject of mills, there were, as you, as you will all know, several mills in the area covered by the research of the Bremhill Parish History Group. And these included the one-time fulling mill of Stanley Mill, fulling being a process in the making of woolen cloth, and Stanley Mill later became a grist mill grinding corn. I'd like to say a little bit about Tifferton Lucas, because although this was quite a small settlement, uh, you would expect everybody almost to be involved in agriculture. But in fact, um, in 1624, Tifferton Lucas had a carpenter and by 1660, a glover was working in the village. Charles Brown of Tifferton Lucas was working as a butcher in 1758 when he took on an apprentice and James Powell was working in the village as a carpenter in 1836. We also have a record of a craftsman working with withers in a cottage in the village in the 1890s. The Moravian School at East Titherton is well known, but what is less well known is the existence of a small school at Titherton Lucas. The only evidence I've been able to find about it is in 1767, in a, when it was in a cottage in Tifferton Lucas, and the cottage belonged to the vicarage of Chippenham. It was let to a labourer or a woman, the vicar of Chippenham didn't seem 
too concerned or to know too much about who exactly it was led to but it was this person who kept the school and so therefore was the school teacher unfortunately the vicar was applying for permission for a faculty in the jargon to demolish the cottage owing to the cost of repairs um, we don't know how long the school had been there and we don't know what happened to the school or to the school teacher if the cottage was demolished and it probably was I've been talking about people earning a living, but I'd just like to end with a short account of someone who chose to work for the good of the village without having to earn a living. Uh, this relates to Titherton Lucas again. In 1836, the Salisbury and Winchester Journal newspaper published a substantial extract from a pamphlet of the Reverend William Bowles of Bremhill, addressed to the church commissioners. And this pamphlet had in part been in support of a friend in the church, um, a most zealous and exemplary character, according to Bowles. The zealous and exemplary priest was Charles Audrey, who was curate of Titherton Lucas. The heartrending account by Bowles implied that Audrey had been deprived of a curacy following the death of a vicar, and that Audrey now getting grey in the veil of years, had nevertheless continued serving a church, consoling and relieving the poor, instructing the young, and in all the anxious duties of a faithful church minister in the parish next to my own, without one farthing of remuneration. Bowles' attempts to procure a parish for Audrey had come to naught. So farewell, my good friend Audrey, wrote Bowles. I'm afraid we must now give up all hopes of your ever hearing one of the sweetest of all sounds to a curate, that of a village peal, welcoming him as rector or vicar to a parish of his own. But this pathetic account of his situation came as news to the Reverend Charles Aubrey, Audrey, curate of Titherton Lucas, a letter swiftly followed in the Salisbury and Winchester Journal, in which Audrey wrote that he had in fact voluntarily resigned from a curacy on the death of the incumbent. He did not state which parish, but the Church of England clergy database, which is online, would suggest that the parish was that of Kington St Michael. Audrey had then, at his own request, and being a bachelor possessed of an independent income, been assigned the unpaid duties of the chapel at Titherton Lucas. This little cure I have now held for ten years happily and contentedly, Audrey wrote. The curacy of Titherton Lucas was quite enough for Audrey, who was well contented to finish my Christian course in the quiet and humble retirement in which I have always lived. Nevertheless, Lest he should have hurt the feelings of his old friend Bowles, he made sure to praise Bowles kind and good and kind and well-meaning, but perhaps too partial friend for his efforts on Audrey's behalf. So I hope you've enjoyed this short talk of some of the ways in which people made a living licitly and illicitly in the past. And I have to say that I really look forward to reading more about the research of the Bremhill Parish History Group in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rosalind. Um, I'm just unmuting everybody and um, opening it all to questions. So if anybody has any questions, fire away. I've got one, uh, if I may, Sarah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Thank you very much, Roslyn, for a fascinating talk. Um, one of the things which always um, interests me is, is what level of prosperity there was in the village or the villages of the parish. Any, any thoughts or observations from what you've seen on the relative prosperity between the villages in our parish and the other ones within your um, research for the uh, um, outer villages of Chippen and VCH? Right. Um... I probably can't speak with so much authority on Bremhill, but I can speak more about uh, Stanley and Titherton Lucas, if that's all right. Yeah. I'm sure Louise can Louise can fill you in on on Bremhill. Yeah. Um, 
the other par the other well not so much parishes the other settlements I was doing for Outer Chippenham um, were uh, included Allington and Rowden and Loudon and a couple of others as well and my impression was was that I think Allington, Allington was a fairly poor parish Stanley and Titherton Lucas were as far as I can could tell slightly more prosperous but the problem is with these very small parishes or very small settlements rather um, it can be quite difficult to find the data about you know how prosperous people were um, Loudon um, I think when is quite poor because you have you have a lot of you know building going on you have that because that becomes a, a suburb of a suburb of Chippenham um, which Stony Titherton Lucas doesn't really do to that extent it does become very agricultural it's, it remains very agricultural certainly in the period that I was looking at I, I guess um, I guess my observation was sort of looking at the quality of the houses in Titherton Lucas I mean there's a hmm. you know there's there's relatively large number for the size of the settlement of quite substantial well-built houses built I guess between the sort of 16th and 18th century yeah Yes, I think what I'm looking forward to is when somebody does um, does the land ownership and that because that wasn't part of the brief that I was uh, dealing with. Um, and then we'll be able to see more about you know, the big landowners, but also um, the, you know, the, the smaller land and the smaller the tenants as well and people who are living in cottages, which for all we know might might you know, have been there, but might have you know, long gone. Yes, more research. Did the canal which went through Stanley, uh, you know, did that produce any work or any particular tree? Um, area? There, there was a wharf at Stanley. Yeah, I didn't mention that. There was a wharf at Stanley. I haven't found anybody who worked. When looking at the census returns, I didn't find anybody who was working for the canal company. That doesn't mean nobody was. Um, and it doesn't mean that the canal wasn't important, but yeah, there, there, there was a wharf there, yes. And, and there were tolls, I mean, there were toll houses, or uh, were they were collecting money for the things going along, and there was obviously the canal builders. Mm. Uh, okay. As a matter of interest, um, I'm currently doing some work on the canal, and the uh, man that was involved in its making or its designing and progress was a chap called Whitworth and he in fact lived in Stanford and he's died, he died here and his oh. wife and his daughter and they're all buried in Brenhill Church but I'm right. doing some research at the moment for the parish newsletter on Mr Whitworth. Right, that's really interesting to hear, thank you. Um, it's Helen. You were talking about cloth making and mills. I was looking at the history of Stanley Abbey this week. And of course that owned Stanley Mill, Hazelin Mill, Scott's Mill. They were all fulling mills. So, you mm. know, going back to um, much earlier times, uh, cloth making was a big activity in the parish. Yeah. It, there, was, there was a shop in Charlcote that was selling cloth in, in the 18th century. It obviously spread right up through Charcot Spurt Hill. And this there were, I done, did a couple of wills from uh, people up in the Charcot area where they were connected with cloth. But what you were saying, Martin, was uh, about the size of the houses, I thought quite interesting that, that in Bremhill, it struck me, <clears throat> particularly in the 18th century, as a little bit of the opposite. That on a number of the wills that I, I did and looked through, there were quite clearly a lot of well-off people in Bremhill. Um, but there aren't any houses, except for the vicarage now, that are large and substantial of the kind that are down in Titherton Lucas. I remember doing one will um, of, of a gentleman in Bremhill. Well, his profession was gentleman, full stop. And he was quite clearly extremely well-off. Um, there was evidence in the will of, um, of a literary background. He had a library, lots of books, 
Um, he had a number of outhouses, uh, a number of rooms that were described. The house was obviously big. But of course, there's no trace of any house like that now today. And most of the houses in Bremhill are relatively, or certainly were at the turn of the century, relatively small. I guess that's a function of the of the ownership of the of the estate, um, you know, the, the owned by the Lansdowns probably. Um, but intriguing to try and work out where where he uh, where the gentleman lived. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, going back to the affluence of people, I think a, a lot depended. There were cyclical booms and slumps of um, local agriculture, which had a big effect on um, um, uh, the labourers themselves. I think the landowners, uh, particularly the Lansdowns, really helped by the provision of things like allotments, which alleviated um, some of the, the local distress. But I think at particular points it was really quite terrible and people were on the sort of verge of starvation it had actually reached that kind of level but you know a few good harvests could completely change it change things and bring down the cost of um food and everything which had had a big impact um so i, I think it depends on the affluent side on, on where you're at when you're actually looking <laughs> that's all I wanted to say. And also on the built environment, I think that's the bit that I'm next going to be looking at. But there were definitely, I mean, there was some kind of um, mansion house next to the, the church that was owned by the Baintons and actually lived in by the Baintons. And that's all completely gone. So there's obviously so much that has been, um, you know, replaced, built on, sort of lost, that still yeah. needs to be discovered. Yeah. And I'd just like to say from the point of view of the Stanley and Titherton Lucas um, that the research I was doing was on the social, economic and religious history. And what's coming is, as I mentioned, the land ownership, but also the built environment, which will be covered in a section called um, you know, settlement and population. And so I haven't been covering the built environment. But maybe, maybe, maybe I'll get the contract to do that. I don't know. <laughs> I've got enough to do. <laughs> um, Rosalind, were there any other interesting co contrasts between the, the settlements within our parish and the other ones you looked at that you think are worthy of further investigation? Um, I think I would be wary about saying too much because I'm aware that I'm the outsider and you're all the experts. On no, no, I'm looking for the outsider's perspective. Perspective. Outside this perspective, right? Okay. I think um, I, I think my answer is going to have to be quite personal and based on my research. Yeah. Um, but of course, I have been very recently. I mean, the work I've been doing for is recently is on um, Harden Huish. And what's interesting about Harden Huish is the way that it's totally by the manor. It there's the manor and that it employs quite a lot of people, not necessarily from within Harden Huish, um, some of them come from outside uh, and some the distance outside as domestic servants. And the rest of the parish of Harden Huish, apart from the rectory and a couple of farms, is really quite poor and it's very, and the population is very small. And that really, to me, when I was doing the research for Bremhill, contrasts with the situation in Bremhill, which I get the impression is obviously much larger and isn't so dominated by one family, by, by one household. Um, and I think the same to a certain extent in other, the, the other settlements that I looked at for Outer Chippenham. I mean, I, I know that Thomas Crook is very famous and the Crook family are very prominent in Titherton Lucas, but they weren't actually the Lord of the Manor, as far as I can tell. So I think, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of contrast in the Chippenham area between uh, larger parishes where there's no overall manorial control and as, you know, smaller parishes, and I'm sure as the research carries on, we'll find more examples perhaps of these you know, larger parishes where there's not overall control and smaller parishes like Hardenhuish where there, it does seem to be a lot more control and there is one very dominant landowner um, you know, for a couple of hundred years. And not necessarily the same family, but the, the, the holding of the estate is very, very dominant. Um, 
and I just wanted to say quickly something about you know South East Wiltshire which is what I'm starting to research at the moment which is very different from North Wiltshire I mean I've been spending five years on and off researching the Chippenham area and now I'm researching South East Wiltshire and it's quite interesting how much more arable there is there's quite a lot of woodland I know there's wood in Bremhill but there's a lot of woodland in South East Wiltshire um, and the whole focus you know shifts um, people don't go to Chippenham obviously they're looking towards Salisbury and to a certain extent towards Romsey so you get this whole yes it, it, it's very interesting seeing, seeing the contrasts um, yeah <laughs> I could witter on about this for ages <laughs> uh, that's, that, that, that's interesting thank you uh, I just wanted to say, uh, Rosalind, it was really interesting how you'd used court records to illuminate um, <laughs> the local <laughs> economics of Bremhill. That was really interesting. Is a lot of that online at the moment? Were you able to access it easily? Yes, um, no trouble at all. Um, the relevant book, in fact, it's the Wiltshire Records Society. So it's their book and it's just get the reference for you. Um, oh, don't worry, you can give it to me. I've got your email, I'll email it to you. Yes, it, it, it's Wiltshire Record Society, volume 15. Okay. But I'll send, I'll send you the reference. But that's online. A lot of the yeah. Wiltshire Record Society, I mean, you probably know that they're, they're available online, which is fantastic. Yeah, it was just really Will it be possible to get a copy of your talk or have we videoed the talk? It just that you said loads of really interesting things. I was trying to write it down, but couldn't write as quickly right. as you were talking. I mean, what I can do is I can tidy up my paper a bit and put the references in neatly. And then I could email it to Martin and to Louise and she can, or, and they so can say, to you. Perfect, yeah. Would that be all right? Yes. Okay. And in answer to your question, Helen, yes, we are recording it as well. You mentioned earlier that the uh, recordings were going to be made available. What do you, what's your thought process on that? Because I'd like to re-watch some because I, I, I'm getting older and I miss some of the important points. Yeah, no, so thank what are your you, well, um, where I, when I can find out where they've gone, uh, whether they've gone into some cloud or somewhere on my machine, then the plan is that between Craig and I, we will end up putting them on our um, Bremhill Parish history website. Um, and I will, once they're up there, I will send round a link to the email group with them on. We're obviously as well just about to organise the four talks for our um, history trail stroke festival in the new normal that we find ourselves in. Um, so that will be going into the newsletter and obviously we'll send emails nearer the time. Um, but for your diary, they're going to be Friday the 11th, Saturday the 12th and Sunday the 13th of September in the evening. Okay. You haven't um, had anything back yet to put into the newsletter? No, that's because I need to actually do the Zoom links. So I will do that ASAP and send that out today. Yeah, if you could, because it's being put together at the moment. Yeah, so. no, I know. Yeah, yeah. A quick one on the on the Zoom meetings as well. We we've got the option of either having the just an audio of the of the call or a video of the call. And so we can put both on or we can put either on. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Craig. Okay. It's always nice to see a face, but I, I understand uh, that you the, just doing audio is a lot less space. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, are there any more questions before we let Rosalind go? Well, I found it very interesting. Uh, living in Stanley, I find it interesting to know who did what in Stanley, and, and I find that quite interesting, particularly as uh, going right back to the Abbey, there's a lot of activity here. So mm. thank you for that, uh, Rosalind. Thank you. No, thank, thank you for thanks, asking me. Thank you. Thanks, Rosalind. Very, thank you. very interesting. It's quite interesting, in fact, to see from what you were saying too, that when looking, looking across the census reports from 1841, onwards how in in the Bremhill area it changed and you can quite you can see quite clearly 1901 and 1911 
there is a much greater emphasis on dairy farming than there is in, in 1891, 1881. More cowmen, um, more dairy maids and so on in, in occupations um, than there were 40 years earlier. I think it's quite interesting also then to take that forward a little bit and look at the 1939 register and when you look at the occupations then we, we see people working in engineering be it um, the railways or work working well in Chippenham basically at Westinghouse and uh, a lot of people started to get involved off the farm and I think that's quite noticeable between 1911 and 1939. No, there was a considerable drop in population between 1891 and 1911. I mean, the population in Bramhill almost halved. Interesting. Yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to unpicking that census stuff that you've been working on, you and it's going to be really interesting to see what else we can get. And I noticed earlier on, um, when the things like the railway comes in, you start getting. Um, uh, railway labourers, but then they disappear again. So things just are in a constant, constantly changing. Mm -hmm. Well, I noticed in the 39 one, a lot of people are actually starting working in manufacturing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then, but in the previous century, how the um, the textile sort of drops off by the 1830s. Oh. Yeah, so that's visible too, and how that textile industry is completely lost from within the parish itself. There's a lot to there's a lot to discover, I think, with the with the economic history of the the village. Hmm. We can't have access to the nine. 1921 census yet, can no, we? No, not, not yet. No, not we're going to wait another year. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> it's going to be on Find My Past. I think Find My Past have got the um, the, the, the sole um, publishing rights for the first year, and then after the first year, I think Ancestry and other places will have it, but I think Find My Past have got the contract for the first 12 months. Right. Oh, okay. Uh, but we can go further back. I've been looking back to 1841, 1851, 1861, yeah. 1821. Some of it's yeah. very hard to read. Yeah, and the format changes quite significantly through the, the century. And that's part of the reason why I decided to focus on the end of the century as well, because it was more um, consistent throughout. But uh, did you find anything interesting, Helen? Um, well, I'm trying to sort of map the um, the farms and labourers and cottages, um, even just trying to follow the farms through, because they're all called by different names, you know, like you mentioned James Fell, and then it becomes Fell's Farm in the next census. <laughs> um, and eventually you can kind of work out from the acreage and things which farm is which. Um, and so many cottages, of course, they're all just listed as cottage, cottage, cottage. So trying to work out where they were and how many, the farms say how many labourers they had. And then trying to work out whether that equates to the number of agricultural labourers living in the cottages. It's like a massive puzzle, which I haven't solved yet. I hope you're going to write it up. Yes. <laughs> what I've done, Helen, on some of the sentences, I've tried to work out where the enumerator walked to and what his route was and from a known cottage that I know now and then I can try and work out which cottage is which. I don't know whether you've thought of doing that. Well, or track trace the enumerator. I tried to but they seem to go in a different order. <laughs> they're not consistent from no. one sense to another. No, they're it not. depends whether they went to the pub or not on their journey. <laughs> They also, I don't know if they did the route twice because when Sarah and I were, look, Sarah James and I were looking at the um, the Childcut Spurt Hill Fox and ones, they seem to have done it the route first of all of going from um, Spurt Hill, a uh, Childcut Spurt Hill Fox and then then and then later on, it's two or three pages, and then it then goes back to then listing Fox and Lock and listing some more in Spurt Hill. So did would the enumerator have called twice? 
I, when I was looking up a village I used to live in, I think the enumerator did call twice because the second version, there was lots of crossing outs on the original register. So I think whoever the enumerator's boss was, in some instances, said, go and do it again. It's not good enough. So I think you may have hit the nail on the head there, Craig. Yeah. I, but think also, sorry. I, I was just going to say, but also some of the uh, pathways that they went on were quite distinct pathways or tracks um, for in those days. And now you have to look at old maps as to where these pathways were. So, for example, in Stanley, they came from the A4, from um, the um, Platinum Garage, straight across to uh, what is now Middle Farm. Um, but this is now just a footpath, but it was actually a very distinctive track in the past. And that would be the track the enumerator obviously took when I tried to trace it. So you need an old map uh, appropriate to the year of the sentence. And also, because he then because he then potentially went twice, you end up with the same person potentially being listed twice because they might not be residing in the same place. And I and I found that where you've got like a servant who might have been living with the employer in one on one day, but although, although although it was meant to be done on that particular day, on the on the following day they were actually at home for the weekend or whatever. I don't know, but they, they definitely appear twice. Because uh, yeah. it could have been done on the same day, even if they had called a couple of times, it should have been the same day, but did you actually find um, names duplicated then? No, this was just on my own personal previous experience of looking through the census and finding a servant listed twice or listed by, the name was quite distinct and I found them listed with their family and listed with their employer. <laughs> Yes, I found, I found a similar thing, Craig, when I've been looking at the workhouse. Some people are in the workhouse and also down with their mother or something in a different address. I found that as well. Yes, that's, that's, that's just to catch you out. <laughs> Absolutely. And it did. Talking of the workhouse, the, work, the workhouse was, was um, would have the, from the parish would have gone to, to Khan, I think. Is that, is that, is that people's yeah. understanding? Yeah. Yes, I was about to do an article, or I'm working on an article, on the Khan workhouse, and there was eight people from Brenhill in the workhouse at the time. Yeah, there certainly were, and some of it is really, really sad, because um, to begin with, the parish tried to stop them ending up in the workhouse, but the power had been taken out of their control. Is that right? I didn't know that. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, you can see, if you read the best few minutes, there was, there was some resistance, but, you know, obviously it was uh, a change at the centre, a change from Westminster, um, it was compulsory, so they couldn't ignore it, but they did try and resist it for a time. And then, as I, as I said, it meant, well, first of all, the workhouse in Bremhill was kept open, but it was continuously downgraded. So, they, and Khan, they, they stopped um, things like, um, Bremhill workhouse buying in soap and stuff like that. It was like a subtle, you know, a subtle shift. Um, the Khan insisted that they moved out the children, so all the unaccompanied children were just carted off as soon as the Khan workhouse was opened, and and then finally they just ended up closing it. And then I, I think it was probably um, uh, knocked down and it made way for the new schoolhouse. Oh, is that where it was? You you found it? Well, not suitably, but I think on the balance of probability, um, it was either the, the church house in Foxmoor or or um, there immediately next to the um, next to the um, uh, the church in Brem Hills. So I think it was probably more likely to be be there, but um, I haven't got it conclusively. But I think the time scale suggests. I need to do a bit more digging, but obviously the last few months I haven't been able to go and see anything undigitized. Mm. But I'd really like to see your article on the Calm um, Workhouse. That would be really interesting. Work in progress. <laughs> it's all work in progress and we'll never get all the answers, but it's great to get to get some uh, new perspectives. So, um, Roslyn, thank you again very much, and we look forward to sort of further um, engagement with you as, as, as your research continues and ours does, but thank you for taking the time out for us.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.